So just briefly, I want to remind people, in case you came in late, that after uh, question and answer after Greg's talk, we have reception at the Paps, historic Paps Brewery. We've got two buses heading over there, uh, which you're invited to take. The buses will come back. There will be a, a performance after the reception, or sort of at the end of the reception, um, at the brewery. and. Uh, the buses will return to UWM and also to the Double Tree Hotel. So um, please join us there. We've got lots of food and uh, it's a really interesting site. Center for the Study of Social Media at Ryerson University, Toronto. Um, Greg also teaches in the graduate um, student, uh, the graduate program in communication and culture at York and um, Ryerson University, and in the um, School of Radio, Television, and the Arts at Ryerson. Um, Dr. Helmer's work has spanned a variety of topics ranging from um, new media and software studies like. Um, working on um, mobile and located media, online electoral campaigns and political blogs, um, as well as the intersections between media, um, the financial crisis, and um, the uh, preemption of dissent after 9-11. His scholarship has appeared in a range of peer-reviewed journals and a number of books, among which are um, Profiling Machines, Mapping of Personal Information Economy in 2005, Preempting Dissent, The Politics of an Inevitable Future with Andy Opel in 2008, and Locating Migrating Media in 2010. His latest book with Ganel Langlois and Fenric McKelvey is called The Permanent Campaign, New Media, New Politics, and came out in 2012 with Peter Lang. The book maps, uh, maps the shifting political landscape as participatory platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and blogs multiply the venues for political communication um, and activism and require um, readiness for network communication, what is called permanent campaign. Um, as a founder and director of the Infoscape Center, um, Greg has fostered a tremendous space for um, critical research and scholarship for the development of methods to study social media. Um, this is how I met him. Um, I had the privilege of working for two years at Infoscape Center where he was um, an invaluable mentor for me and a guide. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Greg, who is going to talk about um, going public, accounting in and for the internet. Oh, yes, we also have a book called Infrastructure Critical that came out um, at the end of last year. <laughs> <laughs> So please um, join me to welcome Greg Elmer. Thank you very much for those kind words. I can't believe you didn't pimp our book. Ouch. <laughs> okay, I'm feeling kind of uh, sandwiched here between uh, Lisa's wonderful, yet another wonderful talk, and, uh, and the promise of, uh, I'm assuming there's going to be some drinks at a former brewery, so hopefully... Uh, Hopefully you will hold me to account here uh, with the next uh, hour, so in the next 45 minutes or so. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Um, to go public, that is, to tell, to tell one's story, claim, or counterclaim, is commonly seen as a sign of desperation, frustration, and in many ways, a uh, failure of the so-called system. It serves as one of the few instances perhaps, let's say, out, outside of the celebrity-making industries, where individuals temporarily stand on an equal footing, at least in symbolic terms, with larger institutions, corporations, and societal conventions. To go public is to personalize a perceived injustice, to narrativize and enumerate failed protocols, rules, and regulations. Going public requires resolve, 
It is the last act. It is an exhaustive and isolating gesture. It's, it, it puts one's reputation and very future at risk. So more, more to the point from my presentation today, the act of going, pu going public commonly suggests a breakdown in accountability. The grand modern technique developed to enumerate, deter, and redress political and economic transgressions. The social media revolution, however, has seemingly blurred this act of going public, though it remains an intensely individualized act, as we see in the case of Bradley Manning and many others um, uh, who've been you know, persecuted over the last uh, few years. So-called Web 2.0 platforms, starting with online diaries or blogs, and then of course expanding to YouTube, videotape, first-person testimonials, uh, Facebook, and of course Twitter, have made the act of going public routine. Some might even say banal. Okay. Even in the context of whistleblowing, that is. That is, revealing questionable, unethical, or at times potential dangerous or illegal behavior at home, at work, or at school. Over the same period, let's say roughly the last, this is our lovely uh, Prime Minister, by the way, roughly the last kind of 10 years, a web of government institutions, initiatives, legislative protections, and NGOs have flourished across many Western jurisdictions, in short, governmentalizing this act of going public. It is no, it is no coincidence that in light of past intelligence failures, subsequently intensified surveillance campaigns, and high-profile criminal cases launched over embarrassing WikiLeaks, efforts at controlling instances of going public uh, have become a daily component of political life. Such is, of course, also the case on and across social media, or to be more precise, via social media accounts, where individuals routinely report and constantly update on all things dangerous, odd, irritating, notable, and mundane. Social media accounts are, in short, designed with one overarching goal in mind, to encourage its users to go public and often. Following the work of Lapuma and Lee, going public can also be said to be a derivative act, an effort at governing, that is, accounting for future relationships, risks, and value. The riskier the historical, political, and economic conjuncture, the more explicit the routine, excuse me, the more explicit and routine, the rewriting of the terms of the account. The principal interface that governs sets the terms for an individual's relationship with flows of capital. Such moments of going public, more importantly, typically emerge during moments of crisis or catastrophe, moments precipitated by large-scale changes in the financialization of capital and the reconfiguration of actors, practices, and capital flows in the economy. So before I return to, uh, to talk more about social media, let me begin with the history of language or the languages, practices, practices and forms of accountability, a history of accountability as developed in tandem with the emergence of finance or high capitalism in the 19th century. I'll just leave that up there to ponder. Okay, as an object of study, accounting is commonly discussed by historians as a communicative form. That is, as a form of numerical writing, represented by the account itself. Historians have largely settled on 15th century Florence, at that time, a thriving center of global banking as the birthplace of the modern account. In 1338, Florence hosted over 80 banks and over 100 banks by the following century. It was in this city, this global financial center, 
that Luca Piccoli's Double Entry Bookkeeping Treatise was published in 1494. And here's a wonderful age-appropriate photo of Luca. And here's a wonderful Cartoon Network version of Luca. Okay, Piccoli is everything about arithmetica, geometry, and proportion, which you can probably barely make out the top here, offered an account that logged, or offered an account that logged full lists of assets and liabilities expressed in financial terms, and moreover, included cross-referencing between debits, credits, which were, in essence, the core of the double-entry system. The early history of accounting thus focused largely on defining a new financialized language, a marriage of numbers and meaning. Similarly, J.R. Edwards reminds us that the term auditor derives from the Latin audir, to hear. Feudal auditors delivered their accounting reports by voice. The legitimacy of such, aud the legitimacy of such audits were determined by the reach of sound, the voice of the tax collector, in the town square. Such contractual forms of accounting are, however, rare, at least in the historical literature. Rather, again, the focus of modern accounting was on the emergence of the merchant account, as what Raymond Williams, or as I would say, is what I would interpret as what Raymond Williams termed a cultural form. And so that's what I really want to focus on for the first half of this, uh, this paper, is the account as a, cur as a cultural form. That is, double entry bookkeeping developed new devices designed to improve presentation, alphabetic order, rubric, paragraph marks, differential font sizes, tables of contents, indexes, and so forth. Mary Poovey likewise argues that double entry bookkeeping uh, or double entry bookkeeping accounts, placement of words and numbers on the page, help constitute she says, as well as delimit how a text can mean. Moreover, again, as a cultural form, the double entry bookkeeping or accounting method and text served a much broader cultural purpose for Poovy. It established a political and economic discourse of balance, that a harmony could be enumerated within the marketplace. Such efforts at financial writing, moreover, did not merely represent a symbolic or semantic goal. Rather, Poopy notes that it represented a shift in the understanding of language as rhetoric, to one that recognized that such financial writing served to shift and affect matter. Such economic forms of writing, not surprisingly, also required social forms of legitimation, a professional degree of respect. Worthington notes the earliest accounting businesses, so around 1776 in London, and I should say, some people might be wondering, well, why, why do you focus exclusively on London? If you look at all the major accounting firms uh, in the States, Pricewaterhouse, et cetera, et cetera, they were all originally uh, London-based and some Scottish-based uh, houses. So in 1976, uh, or sorry, 1776 and onwards in London, referred to early accountants as accountants and agents, though others were referred to as, uh, quote, writing masters. In the 18th century, the term master typically denoted a possession of specific skills commonly associated with the teaching competence of graduates of Oxford and Cambridge University. However, by 1822, business directories in England and Scotland no longer included the profession writing master, instead listing the term accountant in, in combination with other roles such as agent, auctioneer, appraiser, arbitrator, and referee. Worthington suggests that, that accountants emerged as a, quote, a comprehensive term and could refer to commission, rent, house, land, insurance, or partnership, and business transfer agents, or it could possibly denote the practice of affecting arrangements between debtors and creditors, end quote. Okay, so dating back to Piccoli's first treatise on accounting, 
Bookkeeping has been largely attributed to various stages of globalization, and one could all, probably also argue imper uh, imperialism, due in large part to the vast distances and times required to put the, the book so-called back in balance. That is, tracking the production, distribution, sales, and payment for goods and services. The full-scale professionalization and governmentalization of accounting, however, occur, occurred in tandem with what Edwards referred to as financial capitalism, which he locates from 1830 to, uh, of course, the present day. Financial capitalism in England was largely driven by the emergence, and here I'm going to talk about railways, sorry, Lisa, <laughs> by the emergence <laughs> of large-scale railway construction very, quick, very quickly, <laughs> and the subsequent financing of the uh, London Stock Exchange, which you see here in the mid-1830s, uh, or at least, well, this is a more recent picture. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, the large-scale railway construction required uh, greater planning, a monitoring of costs at the construction uh, stage, and the separation of capital expenditure from other operational expenses. In addition to wholesale changes wrought by industrial capitalism, or financial capitalism, as, a, uh, as Edwards referred to it. Most historians point to the emergence of limited partnerships and the need to adjudicate and enumerate assets and liabilities during bankruptcy proceedings as contributing fact factors to the growth of uh, 18th or 19th century uh, accounting. In the 1800s, for example, one quarter of limited liability companies uh, dissolved within three years. By 1831, the Houses of Parliament also stepped in to legislate an official role for accountants, pa passing the Bankruptcy Act, again, 1831, which afforded, quote, official assignees to liquidate estates on, the on behalf of creditors. Subsequent changes to the legislation in 1869 permitted direct appointment of accountants, further increasing the amount of ba bankruptcy work that accountants performed. Most importantly, 19th century accountants set out to enumerate the terms of, again, going public. Not only, or not solely assets, liabilities, clients, sales, and stock, but a new relationship to capital itself. J.R. Edwards thus returns to industrial capitalism, the precursor to finance capitalism, to trace the growing need to identify and enumerate increasingly complex components of business enterprises in an effort to understand the relationship between depreciating assets, increasing labor costs, and of course, most importantly, profit. Edwards argues that the enumeration of such relationships were first highlighted during the close of feudal capitalism. He, he, gives, he gives the example of a, uh, of a uh, pottery business in Stoke, the Midlands of, uh, of England, uh, in 1772, it was a business that wouldn't, uh, or kind of a feudal style business, that witnessed a downturn in business. Accountants were then brought in, they were hired to identify the company's costs to determine if the pricing of goods was too high. Thus was born so-called cost accounting, a practice enacted today by the likes of KPMG, companies hired to restructure and rationalize, or rationalize business and government alike. The role of identifying profit as a determining factor in the growth of accounting in the 19th century has been the, has been the source of great debate. And I won't really get too much into this today, but I just want to focus on the economic, the role of the, uh, played by the economic historian Werner Sombart. Sombart viewed double entry bookkeeping as playing a key role in the transition from feudal to capitalist economies, again, as evidenced by the Stoke Pottery example. Sambart believed that such forms of financial writing were used to identify capital and profit, including what he termed impersonalized capital, quote unquote. Impersonalized capital, a new relationship to capital that emerged in the early 19th century and accelerated with the widespread growth of large private institutions and corporations, many of which emerged out of the mid-century railway frenzy. Mary Poovey likewise argues that forms of accountability were fundamentally altered, that is, made impersonal 
when capital was separated from ownership. For Sombart, the growth of board of directors uh, and other managerial forms further intensified the process of depersonalizing capital, which he linked to the economic rationalization and fi financialization of writing itself. Sombart argued that three factors led to the growth and independence of public corporations. The legal construction and governments of, uh, or what he called the firma, the growth of credit markets, or what he called uh, DITA, D-I-T-T-A, and the overriding imp imperative of profit, or ratio, that he located in the account. He argues that the ratio, in, protect in particular double entry bookkeeping, permitted the full representation of the flow of capital through a business. This facilitated, he says, concentration on the idea of creating wealth. Furthermore, this is a quote, furthermore, since the separation of the business from its owners was a necessary feature of the capitalist enterprise, systematic bookkeeping gave material aid to the creation of the capitalist enterprise. The business replaced the entrepreneur, end quote. Now, contemporary political economists have in some respects picked up where Sombart left off, particularly those concerned about the ratio of contemporary computer networking, bringing this back to, again, the main focus, I think, of, of our gathering here in Wisconsin. A wide array of critics have bemoaned the lack of accountability of such networks and media platforms, some concerned about the dark intranets populated by anonymous actors, which we talked to a little, a little bit before, while others question a lack of transparent <laughs> privacy policies. Still others, to bring us closer to Sombar, similarly highlight the identification of profit as a determining factor in the economic exploitation of individual internet users today. Now, the terms and conditions of going public today, however, would suggest an aversion of Sombart's historical thesis, a resurgence of what he dubbed the historical individual and the individual entrepreneur, the user that is, called upon and impelled in many ways to go public with all matters urgent, though more likely mundane. So building upon my overview of 19th century financial or high capitalism, the, my history of, of high capitalism, and in particular, the growth of accounting forms, practices, and regulations, I want to suggest that the contemporary historical individual in capital is being subject to a process of depersonalization through social media accounts, through their being accounted for by capital. An important caveat that is not typically appreciated by those that argue that uh, such accounts merely serve as legal protocols or end-user agreements between users and corporations. Such perspectives, more often than not, articulate inevitable concerns over privacy. And we've already uh, heard this uh, invoked a couple times already this afternoon. Um, their goal, then, is one of bringing to light or making transparent contractual relationships. I want to suggest, uh, I'd like to suggest as, uh, as I move forward here, however, that, me that social media platforms are largely constructed, revised, and designed in the first instance to enumerate the terms of going public today, a process that depersonalizes, or better still, impersonates the individual, him or herself, through a force clustering of uh, a force clustering of their friend-like profiles. Importantly, this is not a loss of privacy per se, nor an exploitation of surplus uh, labor power in the first instance, but rather a new form of accounting that valorizes the individual point of view. We could say that uh, that first-person interface. Uh, point of view that is also very uh, uh, pervasive on uh, gaming platforms. 
So it valorizes that individual first-person point of view while collapsing it into a capital-friendly set of forms and attributes. User-generated content is, in other words, a financialized form of writing, not a monetized one. Okay? So not a monetized one. It is a financialization of expression and communication, a writing of the terms of capital that are not individually monetized, the so-called market of one, or made strictly profitable through the individual, again, in or herself. Um, so permit me to expand upon these points further um, by considering the, what I would call, again, the contemporary ratio of social media or the perspective I'm bringing today about social media accounts. Um, and I'd like to do that by investigating recent and what we see as kind of constant or seemingly constant changes to social media accounts on popular web platforms such as uh, MySpace, Google, um, and of course uh, Facebook. So I think given the, the period of time I have to talk about today, um, I'd like to focus on uh, Facebook. Let me see if I can get this going here. God, that's so awful. <laughs> I was going to talk over this, but the music, like, I'm going to have to rap over this. Facebook users witnessed the addition of a news feed on their home pages, and I think you saw that earlier on in this, uh, in this video here. In essence, an interface that visualized in near real time the contributions of one's friend networks. The, the vertical ticker contrasted sharply with horizontal tickers from business news networks and sports television channels. Looped tickers that constantly updated changes to, sto to scores stock prices and time. Facebook's news uh, feed, again, a vertical ticker, conversely, buries communications, and quickly, even after friends repost or comment upon user-generated content. The interface, in other words, accelerated the process of users going public, the need to capture the fleeting attention space of social media's interface. Okay. Um, moreover, the uh, intensified impulse and need to go public online set the stage for Facebook's broader accounting goals, ironically, its project of depersonalization. In May of 2008, Facebook launched its Connect initiative. At the core of the initiative was friend linking, quote unquote, a new form of accounting that linked users with their friend networks in effect, producing an internal to Facebook system of accounting, a clustered, excuse me, a clustered profile, and the subsequent terms for what was called profile porting. You kind of, it's probably hard to see, you can kind of see at the bottom here, where you have your Facebook account on, on the, the bottom right-hand side, and there's an arrow pointing to the left that says, bring your friends and info. 
Okay, so that's profile reporting. A network system of accounting that, fac that facilitated the spreading of cluster profiles across websites. MySpace launched a similar initiative a few months earlier when it announced a deal with eBay, Yahoo, and others to share cluster data profiles. While some critics complained about the privacy intruding qualities of these and many other changes to Facebook, such updates had, I would argue, very little to do with individual ownership. Rather, they rep represented a new ratio of Facebook, the expansion of a system in the form of financial writing that impersonated and depersonalized one's relationship to capital through so-called, again, friend linking and profile porting, the clustering of human attributes, followed by its juxtaposition to other balance sheets or these business attributes, assets, again, sales, debits, credits, and the like, from other networked entities such as search engines, e-tailers, and so forth. Sorry. That was my cat. Today, though, it's much harder, again, just almost four years later, it's much harder to speak of the ratio of Facebook as such. Enrolling in many new online services and platforms is now fully accounted for by Facebook through a networked login protocol. And I think many of you have probably seen this now. It's incredible how uh, embedded this uh, logging in uh, account is across uh, many uh, websites and platforms including social media ones. Building upon Microsoft's largely failed passport service, which was recently rebranded as Live ID, Facebook has aggressively sought to expand and further automate the logging in to one's social media account, an accounting, tactic, or an accounting tactic shared by other sites such as Google, and I think Twitter also um, does this as well. In computer science terms, Facebook Connect, Live ID, and other such accounting uh, techniques are said to impersonate login protocols. Our respective relationships then are not only embedded within profile clusters, rather, again, coming back to Sombart, as he as speculated, they create proxy relationships with clients and capital. Such interactions and relationships are then not merely automated, they are ironically made impersonal as we go public with our clustered lives and friends. The scale of such an accounting apparatus cannot be overstated, so much so that the, the ubiquitous computer crash, once attributed to conflicts and incompatibilities between and among applications, is itself now slowly being replaced by a new dysfunction. Sorry. The authentication system misconfiguration, an overloading of distributed software systems that are used to manage the logging in and porting of clustered profiles across network accounts. Such a dysfunctional state of affairs thus compels us to consider the new architecture of accounting as a false promise and project. It forces us to consider accounting and its contemporary correlates as a system of establishing relationships to capital. Some are to be avoided and marginalized, while others are paid greater attention. The promise of accountability, in other words, has emerged as a means of assigning and distributing capital or in the political sphere as a process of displacing and distributing blame. As a form of financial writing, moreover, the accounting of relationships or the accounting for relationships, the process of being accounted for by the musings and behaviors of others, these are not merely dark sides of a dig digitally inscribed ratio. They are efforts at constantly rewriting and impersonating the historical individual. Thank you.
Okay. Questions? Ooh. I'm going to pull at Lisa here, too. There we go. Yes, again. Okay. So, do you think this is uh, a kind of extension of a certain set of, you know, an episteme, if you like, of accounting from the firm to the self? Or is there a sort of qualitative break between them? From the firm to the self? And that's, I'm just, this is how I'm reading this. It's, it's, you know, so well, I was talking about, you know, accounting makes the firm an abstract object. Sure. It can know itself. But it's really, so the capital can function through the knowledge of that object. Yeah. But here it seems you're drawing that in a very interesting way to the yeah. words, well, now, you know, an individual is constructed in a similar way. In a way, it's really not possible. No, exactly, and I guess what I was trying to do in a, in a very kind of uh, underhanded way was undermine the notion of, of ownership, and I did that, like ownership of social media objects, of personal, of so-called personal information, um, and I do that, again, very rhetorically, through going back to Sombart uh, at a point in financial capital where he's saying that there is a separation from the, the running of the business, or the, the firm, the firm, the business and um, and and uh, those or, or or the person who owns the business. So what I'm trying to get out there is trying to establish that in fact there's this proxy relationship that develops, and accountants play a key part in um, in governmentalizing in in uh, providing a set of discourses and rationalities and promises for um, for a just relationship that impersonal relationship, so there's that adjudicator, some of the other word, the referee, the auditor, some of those words that were used in the, in the 18th century. So I think what I, what I tried to do by using some of, uh, by using Sombart's notion of impersonalized capital is to, is to bring it into the present day, obviously, and start to raise the question about, um, about uh, how we need to think of certain, certain systems now online as ones that are purely, uh, purely based upon the process of enumeration, that it is a process that precedes, if you will, uh, some of the discussions that many of us have been having about exploitation, um, the determination of profit and its relationship to individuals. So I hope that well, well, I'm kind of is, is it the same thing? Is there a qualitative difference? Does no. About this no, it's not the same thing, and, and, and I guess I, I was using the, the, the trope, if you will, of going public to try to link the two, um, but no, it's, it's, it's obviously not the, not the same thing, and I, I kind of tried to make a nod towards the fact that, in fact, um, what Sombart was talking about was really a, almost a Durkheimian phenomenon, a bureaucratic relationship that he was, I think, investigating, whereas today we obviously are seeing a, an immense growth of of kind of uh, entrepreneurship, and so I think that's the, that's that's something that doesn't quite fit the the, the marriage, if you will, that came together of those two uh, centuries and the conjunction. So. Uh, yes. Sorry. This is this is a bizarrely technical Facebook thing, um, but I thought that the default of the news feed was most popular, not most recent, and does that affect? the going public issue. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the most recent thing that you often see. The default is the most popular post, and I don't know how that's measured. Um, but sure. does that um, I, I think at one point in time you, you, you were able to choose which which kind of metric yeah, to, you can, to, to kind of but get into the software bit. Yeah. Um, but, but does that does, does that challenge the notion, of, is, is this your question, that, that it challenges the notion that somehow that, that design, that interface, right. uh, is one that encourages us to contribute in larger numbers, or feel as though the communication that we're putting out there is, is more fleeting? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, yes and no, but I was just wondering if, if that plays into the way that you think Facebook is trying to operate. Um, well, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, I, I, I think it's both popularity, popularity or or a time-based ticker. They both feed into the, the argument that that uh, that there's a there's a need, there's a space, there's a design 
which is encouraging uh, contributions and encouraging uh, constant updating, right? Whether it's through recognizing that others' uh, comments are gaining some form of popularity, or whether or not it's just purely time-based, where things are just being married over and over, and you want to kind of get in there and be to be noticed, and maybe to be thrown back on top of that ticker again. But again, it's, it's going to disappear. A lot of studies say that you know 95% of uh, of, of what gets retweeted, you know, it dies out after an hour, right? The debates and discussions, so. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, Peter. I was curious that you didn't discuss uh, graph search and in this context in particular, mm -hmm. and the sense in which uh, how it was rolled out and what it's trying to achieve, it seems in some sense that, I, I have no worries that Facebook is accounting for all, all of the data that you put into it and keeping track of it. But I think what's difficult for them to communicate to advertisers is how that could be a value to it for them. And it seems like graph search is this way of sort of being able to demonstrate or make transparent the value of those by when people type in our searches and see who likes what in certain sorts of combinations. Sure. And so I wonder if he's reading it that way, or if he's to see that as having a different sort of relationship to the how do you commodify likes or change values for likes? That's a complicated, we're getting into kind of big software uh, uh, questions. I, I think, I'm not sure, I wasn't watching, but there, during the, the whole Facebook video, there was a, a discussion very quickly, wasn't it? I think in 2008 or 2009. Um, but, I, I'm, again, I think that I think that those, for me, are results of uh, of the, the the particular construction of the way in which accounts uh, have been formatted on, on Facebook. This profile portal, right, which I'm, I'm arguing is a depersonalized relationship that we have with capital. So I think a, a lot of people have been arguing that the around you know questions of privacy or or that our contributions are somehow leading to our respective uh, exploitation. So I think the reason why I didn't get into some of those larger questions about, about uh, customized ads uh, or, or their network economies is because I wanted to place the focus uh, squarely on the accounting uh, on, on that platform. This is one, you could talk about Google as well, but I think I just wanted to focus on the fact that it is establishing a new relationship to capital. I think for me that is the, the core of the, the ratio, if you will, of, of, of the Facebook uh, platform as, a, as an accounting system. I think that answers your question. But is it still capital? Is what still capital? It's ca it is... You change the relationship. Well, well, that's why I think I, I kind of, uh, I, I was trying to make a, dis a distinction between financialization, which I think is, is, is uh, in keeping with the arguments I'm making about accounting, versus monetization. And I think that's where Peter, where Peter is introducing some of these other steps, which are then are introduced to take advantage of uh, of these clustered profiles, right? And I, and I made I didn't have enough time today, but I made kind of an allusion to the fact that some of these are, are ignored, some of them are marginalized, and others are paid an intense amount of information uh, or attention rather. Um, and that's how that's how capital is distributed. People get some people who have. The right profiles and the right friends get more access, get more favorable terms for for their account, right? For their accounts, for their mortgages, for their student loans, for this, that, or the other. So, yeah. So, um
Well, let me, let me try to come at it from another angle. Then we're just going to be one, and then maybe we can come back to the maybe the enjoyment of going public is is what you're referring to. Uh, I don't see on, on the more expressly economic uh, level. I, I don't really see. Well, I guess that you use the term ambivalence about going public. Let's just use the same example that I brought to the table today with Facebook. There was a really interesting set of discussions that surrounded the valuation, the going public of that particular company. And what that process was all about was trying to enumerate uh, in very particular accounting terms uh, what the value of that company was. Uh, and if you go through uh, the documentations, and, and including the filings, and um, and uh, my research assistant has, um, the, what what you find is not an ambivalent. And uh, excuse me if I'm twisting your words or your your, your intent of that of that term, but what you find is is a, a very interesting, and, and I think you're right, much more open, confused, complicated search for. Value, um, and I think um, again I haven't spent too too much time. This is going to be another chapter of of, of 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 this book that I'm working on right now. But what you initially found was that Facebook were trying to make the case that we have X amount of users, and so and because of that, this company is worth worth X, Y, and Z, uh, millions or billions of dollars. I can't remember the exact figure, but in fact. What ends up happening is that every, everyone on Wall Street on, and Main Street says that's crap. Not all users are the same, right? Um, you, in fact, have recognized in your own system, on your own platform, that some users uh, are much more active than others and have these clustered profiles. So I think that's an interesting space that, that I'm going to be uh, continuing to investigate to get this notion of of going public that perhaps is a bit more dynamic than what I represented today. So we'll put that to the side for now. The, the, the other question is, I don't think anything that I've said today, maybe I'm just repeating your, uh, your wonderful praise for my presentation today, is, uh, is, uh, is um, I don't think anything what I've, what I've said today negates the fact that people go public because they, they want to share good news. Um, that they want to uh, find long lost friends and high, high school um, partners and, and, and teachers and whatnot. Um, uh, but but still, I, I don't think I don't see the conflict between saying that uh, that, that that people use the system and get enjoyment out of it, but at the same time, it's used by Facebook to enumerate a new relationship to, to capital, right? Because what I'm trying to do is undermine, uh, as I think Lisa was doing earlier, and, and many uh, of us uh, have been doing in the room over the years, is undermine the notion that, that it is an individualized platform that has utopic qualities or li liberatory po uh, uh, possibilities. That's what I'm really looking to undermine. I don't, I don't know, I don't see that as a dystopic project. Necessarily. Right, and I guess your point is it's more effective if it does come down and not continue, right? So it's just push that, right? Um, but I think that couple that wants to marry wants to go public, right? And they sure. say they want a performance of the doing and that it's denied one that it's like, mm -hmm. um, like No, I see what you mean. That's so, a very good example.
an intersection of different kinds of arguments that have come uh, into rubbing with each other. Um, I, I think the people who were looking at the market when the Facebook IPO came along, um, I don't know anybody, you know, if you looked at all the stuff that was going on in the stock market, nobody was saying, we think that you're misunderstanding the relationship of individual users and the relative of individual users. There are all kinds of other conversations going on in the financial industry, but um, I'd love to know if you saw that kind of analysis going on there. I think it's a different set of questions. So, sorry, so um, you're, you're, you're saying that there wasn't that debate that I was talking about? I think in the financial markets, the people who are deciding yes. whether or not to buy and what to Yes, know, that, that's what I was referring to. That, that conversation was there. It did take place, yes. In what kinds of documents? Filings. Um, the, well, also in terms of the uh, litigation that has uh, followed the uh, Facebook IPO as well. I thought the litigation was to the exchange for screwing it up. Mm, no, it was to some of the bro brokerage houses that were promoting the stock. Yes, okay. exactly. Well, there's probably more than that, but that, that's the one that I was referring to, yeah. Um, but you had a number of other questions well, in there. I'm curious, <laughs> I, 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 uh, Don't give me another one. Can we go back to that? simple question so, can, if you could rephrase uh, in a way that, uh, that um, small people like me can make sense of it, what it is you think that is qualitatively different about the relationship to capital, and I'm wondering um, how to relate And, and, and can you? I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with Turo's work. Can, can you? Can, if you give me one sentence, I'll give you a sentence. Fair enough. <laughs> um, that the massive record collection of our personal data about everything we're doing online mm -hmm. actually makes us less visible to each other because advertisers and others who are targeting people have so much more information about us that they can miss all the rest of us who don't. Yes, I, I know less about each other, not more. I, yeah, I guess that that's a similar with, with that reading his work. I would say I'm making a similar argument um, that it's a, it's a system of distribution, right? So it's not that you, you're given access or you're denied. Uh, that's not the case at all. Like the way in which the accounting system works is for Facebook is that they they try to assign value to these different clustered profiles. So what that, I, I'm not quite following you necessarily about how that relates to visibility. Um, clearly it makes more, certain clusters, certain groups, certain attributes, certain behaviors, more visible, more, uh, more, uh, more monetized, monetizable than others. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to ask, not well, what you think might be the relationship between the um, uses of transactional data and click-throughs and those kinds of things mm -hmm. that makes us less visible to each other and the self-presentation and public information that's going on in the ways that that is used. It's the difference between the private information and the public information. Sure. Well, we don't have, we don't have access to, Lisa mentioned this earlier, we don't have, have any access to, to the algorithmic uh, data stream. That's all proprietary information like Google and Facebook and other platforms hide very, uh, very well. Not only do they hide it, but they constantly change it because uh, there are those who are trying to kind of deconstruct it or reverse engineer their logics. So it's an it's an ongoing process of obfuscation and updating and, and changing that. Um, so Lisa, do you want to jump in? Yeah, you know. Um Mm-hmm. 
draw ourselves in the city by, by reposting something on Facebook would be personal. Right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the content that you see is in fact reposted from other places. It's not personal. Someone didn't make it in the draw, except for say, you know, pictures and things like that. But I wonder if you talk more about personalization and if it's varyingly visible or if it's all Sure. Well, I, I think that there is, and I, and I talked about it very quickly in the paper about how the, there is a contradiction, right? That the design, the very design of interfaces is an intensely personal one. It is like everyone in the room, we all see Facebook through our own eyes, so to speak. There, there are no two interfaces that look the same in this room and probably around the world. So it is an intensely personalized uh, interface, right? And so I, I think that is uh, an, an important component of of its rhetoric, is that hey, you can you can see all your your, your closest friends, you can see everyone that matters to you, um, you can see the comments. I, I don't know if I agree with you, but at least the things that are shared are typically commented upon again by your your your, your friend network. But I guess I'm trying to go, go behind the scene, go into the, the more of the software studies and ask the question of what's the relationship that's being constructed, again, to capital. And it's one that is not an individual one. It's one that's always, as we saw in one of my previous slides, we are always ported out based upon, our, uh, based upon all of our friends. That is the core unit of accounting uh, in Facebook, not, not, the individual, not the individual, okay? So I think for me that's, that's the, that's the, the contradiction in the rhetoric that I'm trying to establish, if that makes sense. Um, the, the other thing, if I could jump in uh, to Lisa, is that I think we don't even have to, what, what I want to get a, away from is, is talking about recognizing Facebook or social media accounts as, again, uh, like a bank account, something that you go in and that you open, and that you make a transaction and you fill it with things, right? Um, maybe if they make it hard for you to close it, and, and there's all the services that they try to push to you, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the form of accounting. That's not the ratio that I'm talking about today. In fact, we are, like, is there anyone in the room that doesn't have a Facebook account, for example? Yeah. But you, you're already, uh, I would argue, you are already accounted for by this system. Right? So if you were to sign up, all of a sudden, you would have all this information and all these attributes I've seen a friend do it as an, as an experiment. They automatically pop up. It's already there. You've already been accounted for because all your friends and your, your parents and your kids and your cousins are pointing at you or tagging you, um, are making notes about where you went to school. So that's so there is a, a separation again between ownership, going and and opening up an account and putting your things that you own in there, the money, or or things that you owe in there. And, and, and so, and it's and it's more than just about automation. Yes. Right. Yeah, sure. so there, I mean, there's other kinds of accounting that Facebook does, and that is 20 people. You know, Mackenzie Ward, Greg Elmer, and 20 other people like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, friends are accounted for, and that certainly is just another one. And yes. I remember it's all over my Facebook. I have 42 you know, messages. It says 42 events. It says 12. And, you know. Yeah. And so forth. So. One question is, how do you deal with, or do you deal with that kind of accounting with Facebook? Well, accounting, mm -hmm. there's a wonderful uh, app you can get by uh, the Facebook demetricator, I think the name of the person, the same grocer, I think, created it, where they raised all those numbers, so it was just say people like it, and so forth, uh -huh. which I think directly addresses the idea that the accounting, at least, is not our accounting. But the other thing I'm interested in, I think that you're getting at as well, is that there's that kind of accounting which is visible to us, and then there is the invisible kind of accounting that is the data as a flex of identity as Paul has talked about it, that we are leaving on Facebook as, as well. So I think that, you know, I really think that I, I do like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think thinking about this as, you know, in terms of accounting makes sense. But I guess the, the main question is, how do you deal with those, or do you deal with those accountings that are happening on screen? Yeah, that's, 
That's a good question. I, I, I'm, I would anticipate that some, like why do certain names pop up? Like you said, why is it uh, Greg you know, and Alessandra like and then 21 others? Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's, a, there, there, there's some uh, algorithmic uh, code at work there that visualizes my name based upon perhaps what you've uh, discussed or commented upon. I don't, I don't know that. I think that would be an interesting uh, phenomenon. Some of the changes that Facebook had tried to do over the years, I think it was in 2009, 2010, was to introduce, I'm not sure if it's still around, some of you may know, um, a system of kind of breaking down your friends, you know, acquaintances, close friends, family members, uh, which pops up as well. So I think that there is a qualification, there is an accounting, uh, a micro accounting of the friends that's also going on as well, which is assisting that platform in, in making its clustered profiles more uh, qualitatively dynamic, I think. So I think that's part of what's going on. So that, that's something I think I'm going to follow up on as well. And Gary, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask, I'm, lose, I'm losing the thread a little bit through the discussion of the difference between impersonal technologies, depersonalization, sure. machine enslavement, use of expectation, you get in front of an ATM. These are very different, you know, these are all very different ideas. So, sure. if you could bring us back to, to the, that initial usage of impersonal. Yeah. That, and why you chose that. I, I think it's because, sure, sure. I think it's because it, it, it sets up, well, it, it sets up uh, a different relationship to capital, right? It separates ownership from, from the, the conduct of business. Okay, that's, that's some, bar, some parts. So the reason why I, I, I then take that kind of depersonalization, it's a depersonalized relationship to capital, and then talk about uh, the, uh, the, the, I think the, the, the term I use is uh, impersonate, is because that's a, the computer uh, language that's being used to talk about the proxies that are established um, in, in that process of kind of logging in and of grouping together and porting the, these, uh, group, these groups, these clusters of, of profiles. So I guess you're right. Um, if, if there is one thing that's not fully fleshed out in the work so far is, is a more ex expressly political and economic definition of depersonalization as such. Some part has a very, uh, very um, obvious kind of uh, Marxist uh, interpreta interpretation of, of what depersonalization means. It means that, well, when, when it's at a distance, then all these things are, are then uh, uh, then wrought uh, upon the individual, on the, on the worker, that there's a, a greater focus on, on profit and, and, and the like. Um, but that's, uh, that's not something that, that I, don't, I don't think I've had, quite honestly, I had enough time to kind of flush that out vis-a-vis uh, Facebook. I think what I also want to do, uh, Gary, is kind of not just focus on that one platform as well, yeah. and, and to look at uh, some other ones before I start to, uh, in, start to kind of qualify what that search for profit is and its relationship to, to the uh, impersonal uh, technologies which ex distance or depersonalize us from capital, right? Um, there is a kind of, par uh, sort of a parable for me yeah. uh, in this uh, situation where it's, it's not to do with, the, with the Facebook, but you think of a, a usage, a positive usage of a concept of a balance sheet critical, reflective usage. Like the Luz Pataghi write this group, they post to their critics after Andy Edwards comes out and causes a storm. They call it the balance sheet for desiring machines. Mm -hmm. And so how can a book that's so critical of, of, of the character of capital suddenly re, you know, reinvent this concept in a positive way? It's, it's entirely puzzling. It, it sort of diffuses the uh, fire mm -hmm. and allows them to sort of step in out of their role as authors and to sort out the mess that occurred and the misrepresentations. Uh, now, can we? Is there something there that's? Yeah, I, I, my, my my sense of, of, of that of that use in, in the literature is not unlike yeah. the, their discussion of uh, uh, Foucault's diagram, yeah. which is that you're right that there is this kind of. Uh, odd kind of 
functional dysfunction to it that they need to maintain to talk about reproduction, yeah. right? So I, I, I agree that that, that and many people have kind of you know uh, suggested that's a bit too romantic a, 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 a use of <laughs> well balance is probably w way more romantic than the, than the diagram that we want. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank you, Gary. Alessandra. No, I think that's an excellent point, and I think a couple of other people have made, made, made similar uh, remarks. And, and, and I think that the, uh, I may have been a bit too uh, quick in, in, in kind of dispelling the importance of the profile, visually, effectively, um, and the role that it plays in social media accounts. So that, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, work done on, including Lisa's done some work on avatars, you know, how, how we represent ourselves. Those things are very important for for profiles, for our attachment, and the way in which we communicate via social media uh, platforms. So, uh, I, I think I think that you're right. I think that there is a relationship between those two. Um, one that that uh, is is more about subjectivity and attachment, um, and affect, and the other one, which is which is a more economic, if, if I can use that term, relationship to capital. So, but you're right. There's there's something that needs to be flushed out there. <laughs> and it would be the latter. I'm definitely going for the latter, which is a, a production, an accounting system, which is about producing different and new and ever-changing relationships. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's at the core of, of that accounting system. And to not recognize the, the importance of those relationships and the ability to forge those relationships, to finance and then to financialize those relationships. You can't talk about monetization. Let's continue the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.